I know I'm a bit late with this one, but I wanted to make sure I did this some real justice. I've taken my time and poured over every frame of The Mandalorian Season 3 trailer to catch everything that I can. I haven't watched any other breakdowns of the trailer from other YouTubers, so I hope I provide something new for you all. If not, hopefully it's not just a rehash of what everybody else has said. I'm sure you've all seen it by now, but the Mandalorian Season 3 trailer is out. I've noticed a few things about it that really stuck out. Released during the Monday night American football playoff game between the Dallas Cowboys and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, we got some familiar shots and some new shots of the highly anticipated third season of The Mandalorian. Now, before I get into the breakdown, I don't want to get into too much speculation. I know a lot of people say there's going to be another Mandalorian Civil War. And that may be true, but this trailer didn't give us much context to the action that it does show. So, I want to be really careful. I also don't want to simp over it too hard. But yeah, I'm super excited for this show. Oh my god. And now, a word from our sponsor, me. Hit the subscribe button and give the video a thumbs up. Now, let's get back to the Mandalorian Season 3 trailer breakdown and some of my own thoughts on it. The Mandalorian is something I have been looking forward to more than any other series. There are others I'm excited for, but we know where we stand with this show. We know the level of writing that has gone into the previous two seasons, and it's exciting to see this culture come to live action in a big way. And more than two years has been long enough to get this right, we hope. The first thing that I noticed was the sets. While the volume was a nice bit of technology, it may have been used a bit too much in the previous seasons, but this season looks different. To me, the volume didn't add much ground inconsistencies that we would see in an average ground setting. It always seemed too flat, with some props sprinkled here and there. Maybe that's just a nitpick on my part, but this trailer looks as though more actual locations are being used. As we saw with the Cassian Andor series, real locations add depth that technology is hard to replicate. I like the volume, but I think it should just be used sparingly. Okay, let's get into the scenes shown. First, we see a group of people ascending a rocky ridge. I'm sure we can safely assume these are Mandalorians. But as I said before, I don't want to speculate too much, as these figures are off in the distance. Directly following that, we have a group of Mandalorians saluting, much like we have seen cinema depicting a Roman soldier saluting. Next up is the image of those Mandalorians again. What strikes me as curious is the Mandalorian on the left has his rangefinder on the left side of his helmet. Typically, Mandalorians keep their rangefinders on the right side. I thought maybe this is a reverse image, but if you look at the Mandalorian on the other side of him, he appears to have his rangefinder on the right side of his helmet. But that could just be something in the background creating an illusion. In the sh same shot, we see the aforementioned Mandalorian with his clan signet. It's one we haven't seen before unless I've missed it somewhere. If you know the clan, let me know in the comments below. I'm really interested in this. Another curious bit of this shot is how the left side rangefinder Mandalorian is the only one I've seen with the older style of Mandalorian body armor. For those who don't know, the style of armor that Din Djarin wears is what's called post-imperial, meaning after the fall of the empire. But the armor has been seen being used before that. For instance, in the Cassian Andor series, the armor in Luthan Rail's shop is post-imperial. But back to this oddball Mandalorian. His armor is traditional. At least the chest plates, abdomen, and collar guard are. It's similar to the style Boba Fett and Jango Fett wore and Death Watch Mandalorians prior to the Imperial Uprising. Okay, moving on. The next shot is of Dan Djarin approaching from behind a group of Mandalorians. Note the armor style again. Even the females have the post-imperial style, and the rangefinders are on the right side of their helmets. Next up is the hyperspace scenes. Although the visuals of hyperspace travel are iconic to Star Wars, we don't get any real context as to where Din Djarin is going and is in one Naboo starfighter. But I imagine it's during the first half of the season, because Grogu is in the bubble to the rear of the cockpit, and I'll get more into that and some prequel tie-ins to the show seems to have. But in the next scene, Grogu is on Din Djarin's lap in the cockpit, meaning these two hyperspace scenes are not the same moment. Let's pause for a minute to admire 
how cute Grogu is. Aww. Now we go back to the old Western and samurai influences in The Mandalorian with a shot of Din Djarin walking into town like a boss. Grogu also has a carriage, a new one. Remember, his old one was destroyed when Koska Reeves rescued him from the water booty mouth thing back in season two. And whoa, hey, there's a Kowakian monkey lizard. As we saw in the previous trailer, of course. Those are always fun to have around. Actually, my favorite of this species is the one Hondo Onaka carried around. I mean, what kind of pirate captain doesn't have a bird on his shoulder? Where did the cliche even come from about birds on pirates? I'll have to look that one up. Next up, Grief Karga approaches and greets our Mandalorian hero. But this doesn't look at all the way we left Grief Karga. He was the magistrate of Navarro when we last saw him. Maybe a promotion? Because this doesn't look like a lava planet full of schmutz and filth. It's actually really clean and the architecture is more like Naboo. No, I'm not speculating. It just reminds me of it. Grief Karga, King of Naboo. Has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? If it is Naboo, they have become diverse because there appears to be Twi'leks in the background. We got some flying through a storm, but behind the Grogu bubble, we can see Din Djarin acquired an astromech. Not just any astromech. I'll get into that in just a bit. Then, we are back to the Children of the Watch, specifically the Armorer. But the shot with Din Djarin seems off to me a little bit. And it is. It's a reversed image. Notice his Mudhorn clan signet is on the wrong side as is his bandolier, and I wish I could have got clearer shots of it, and I tried with Photoshop, but if anybody else has any clearer ones, just email them to me and I'll replace them. Then the big one, Mandalore, but more importantly, the ruins of Sundari. Sundari was the capital city of Mandalore and its inhabited worlds, the center of power and government. It's tragic to see the city that was once bustling with life and natural beauty in such a state. Yeah, and you get to hear my dog barking in the background. Yeah, I stopped the recording until he's done. Sorry about that. Okay, then we get to see just who Din Djarin's astromech really is. A Star Wars favorite with a bad motivator, R4-D4. I guess retirement's out of the question for this guy. Pelimato sends them on their way, and this is confirmation that we are returning to Tatooine. Boba Fett, anyone? Come on, we have to redeem him. But it looks like Din Djarin is zipping away as fireworks explode around him. What kind of celebration could they be having? And now we get the confirmation that we will be heading back to Coruscant, where we see Dr. Pershing in a speeder looking around at the pretty lights and the city that boasts the most buildings over one mile high. That's actually a little-known Star Wars fun fact. The next shot is of Captain Carson Teva out of his X-Wing pilot gear. Next up is a cave scene, or dark mining tunnel of sorts, where Din Djarin picks up an old Mandalorian helmet, assuming it's from a, another scene that's coming up. Was this from a Mandalorian Civil War, or the Purge of Mandalore, or possibly the cave monster we see in just a bit? It could be something completely different, though. Then we get a flashback of Grogu's brush with Order 66. This is one moment I will do a slight speculation on. The Jedi shown are aware of the danger presenting itself. Otherwise, the door probably wouldn't be sealed. But what's on the other side of the door? Is it Anakin Skywalker or just clones using their explosives? We saw that when the Empire was boarding the Tana V4 back in A New Hope. But if this is Anakin Skywalker, could Grogu put two and two together and actually give him another reason as to why he didn't ultimately stay with Luke Skywalker? Meh. We'll see. If that were the reason, Grogu wouldn't have went with Luke in the first place. And now, TIE Interceptors. Damn glad to see these in live action again. They're my favorite TIE fighter. Why? Because they look freaking cool. Duh. Yeah, that's the main reason. But there are other lesser reasons that I won't go into right now. But it appears they're chasing Din Djarin. I'm sure not just for fun either. Next up, we have Sparky. Yeah, that's what I'm calling this droid. I'm really curious about this. Did they find a droid who was programmed to repair Mandalorian armor? If so, wouldn't that be a danger to their society? It wouldn't take much to capture the droid and download his information. But next up is one of my favorite shots. Why? Because this is where the prequel tie-ins really become open. 
Look at all those B-1 battle droids. I love it. There's no other way to make the Star Wars universe feel connected than throwing in pieces from Star Wars shows and movies from the past. For instance, Din Djarin's N1 Naboo Starfighter, an engine from Anakin Skywalker's Pod Racer, and now battle droids. More of them. But also look in the background. We have a version of that weird droid that was on the Jawa Sandcrawler in A New Hope. Old droids, new droids. Looks like this bar only serves their kind. And there's Sparky behind the bar. But how's Din Djarin going to react to battle droids? Remember, his childhood home was attacked by separatists, and his birth parents may have been killed by them. Okay, they were likely killed by separatists. Seems to me in his previous scene, he was threatening Din Djarin, not offering to help fix Beskar. Threatening him? Why? He's an organic in a droid bar. My, how the prejudice has flipped. Sparky doesn't serve our kind here. Next up is my absolute favorite shot of all. Mandalorians jumping from a transport. The Mandalorian culture is my favorite in all of Star Wars. I've mentioned this. They aren't super powered. They're just people who learn how to defend themselves and not just against other invaders, but against Jedi and Sith even. The ones who are super powered. To see Mandalorians in action and in abundance really tears me up. Then we have some little Babu Frick people and a cave monster. With the cave monster, we see Grogu hasn't abandoned the Force entirely. Well, we knew that when he put the Rancor to sleep in the Book of Luke Skywalker. I mean the Book of Boba Fett, sorry. But that's it. That's the comprehensive breakdown of the newest trailer of The Mandalorian Season 3. I hope you enjoyed it or learned something new. Maybe both. Now, another word from our sponsor. Again, me. Hit the subscribe button, give the video a thumbs up, and leave a comment. But that's all I have for today. Until the next video, this is Gerald, a Star Wars fanatic, signing off. Wishing you all great health, happiness, and peace. Thank you all for watching, and remember, this is the way. And positivity in the Star Wars fandom is the only way.